right? Do I actually own and possess the data attached to this thing, right? And I and I take it with me somewhere, or if what I really got is just a link to uh, to your server. Yeah, and then and then it would be have no value. But if you had an atomic NFT where the data was actually stored exactly. too, you're tuned to the Rcast, where we talk about the blockchain on the Rcast. And how your data remains it's the R-Cast. Where R Drive is the topic. Censorship resistant permanence. Yeah, we got it. Oh my goodness. Hello everyone. It is Andrew here with the Rcast. This is episode one. And this week we've got Stanford professor Mark Lemley, who's a gamer who knows a lot about copyright law, who's done work in the NFT space. And we talk about you know, some of the legal issues with NFTs, with parodies and quote unquote remixes and fandom. And we talk about how our weave and our drive can specifically solve some issues that might come up with this. So it was a really cool talk. I met Professor Lemley, not through my time at Stanford, but he was a, or he is a fan of my music. He supported my newest Kickstarter and uh, we started communicating and I, I told him I'm doing this podcast for our drive and I invited him on. And it was tight. So I want to shout out some of our supporters. Shout out to Atlassian because they host the public wiki. So if you don't know, we want to catch you up. So here's what you do. So go to rdrive.io slash learn. And in the bottom right, you can click on the explore knowledge base link. And that takes you to the Atlassian where basically... All the information you need about using our drive, the community, the technology, the frequently asked questions are there. But the site is awesome too. Like the learning center is really helpful. There's a lot of easy to read articles for beginners. Um, we're building the community page. There's just a lot of great information. There's a pricing calculator so you know how much it costs to store your files. And the reason why we like our drive is because it makes your files permanent, censorship resistant blockchain verifiable and you can share them only with the people you want to see them so the encryption is really interesting so we also want to shout out our other supporters that's the r weavers community they're super active all over the internet on reddit and everywhere so shout out to the r weavers and if you want to connect with us we have a telegram channel we are on discord like we have a subreddit we're posting memes we're always going hard constantly spreading the gospel of our drive and so that's what's up so this week let's get into it but before we do i want to talk about the public drive bounty what is the public drive bounty okay so we have a monthly theme every month and the november 2021 theme is food so we're building up a permanent library of human culture and knowledge on the permaweb and over 1500 public drives have already been created on our drive so each month we'll choose a theme for the bounty this month we're looking at historical records pertaining to food because thanksgiving is coming up the american thanksgiving is coming up shout out to the canadians who had theirs and um anything like recipes cookbooks pertaining to food is awesome so the reward the grand prize you'll win two ar and the runner-up will win one ar so to win get an appropriately named public drive upload the most complete the most original info you have pertaining to food so share the public drive on twitter at at our drive app and use the hashtag our drive bounty And if you tweet before November 13th, the winning drive will be awarded their prizes during our community call on the 15th. So let's keep it moving. I will announce these on the RCAST as they come up. And the RCAST is going to be dropping every two weeks. We have a new guest talking about something fresh. So here we go. This is my interview with Professor Mark Lemley on the first inaugural edition of the RCAST. So welcome to the RCAST. I am here with Mark Lemley, who is a uh, law professor at Stanford. We connected through my music. You got your law degree at Berkeley, and you've done a lot of work with intellectual property, and now you're a professor at Stanford. And I guess my question for you is, did you ever see yourself coming back to, um, to teach at Stanford when you were an undergrad, or was that kind of just like a fortunate series of events, or was that the goal when you were an undergrad? No, it wasn't the goal. I mean, you know, I was, uh, I, I studied political science. I was going to, I don't know, run for office, change the world, that sort of thing. I went to law school and uh, because I think if you have a political science degree, you're, you may be legally required to go to law school. Um, <laughs> certainly everybody does it. Uh, and kind of to my surprise, fell in love with, with the law and with intellectual property and technology law in particular. And at that time, it was 
and end of the 80s, early 90s, uh, IP was just taking off. The internet was just becoming a thing. And so being one of the first people in that space to actually think about what the legal issues are, were was a lot of fun. Uh, but I, yeah, I, didn't, I never imagined I'd be back on campus teaching, but it's been great to be here. You're, you're a gamer, right? Am I correct? You're a video game fan? Yes. Yep. I am a video game uh, player and, uh, and also uh, teach a class in video game law. So that must be quite a popular class, <laughs> considering the, your uh, audience there. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, and you're right. I think it's um, it's I think it's great for the students who can feel like uh, the, some of the things they do for fun are connected to to real world legal issues too. It's interesting looking at your. I was watching some of your um, talks today on YouTube, and I like how one of the points you you make is that you're a fan of innovation and how that works differently in different industries. And I saw a talk where you talked about how the value of competition is that it drives people to act in an innovative way. And thinking about nerd culture, gaming culture, like that is the key to the longevity of that whole world. And I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit on that, because I thought that was an interesting point that, you know, relates to music and hip hop and any sort of artistic field, like innovation as an asset, right? As opposed and how competition can drive it. Would you agree? Absolutely. And yeah, I think in particular in video games, one of the things that really does drive it and make it such a popular thing is, is that it's participatory. You know, I like I like movies. I like music. I have no musical talent. I'm never going to be participating in the making of music. Um, but everybody participates at the level of playing in the games. Uh, but but I think one of the, the best games and the, and the most enduring ones also give you an opportunity to kind of build and give back. People make mods. Uh, uh, some of the games uh, you just you're, you're constructing uh, what in pretty much whatever you want. And I think that taps into something fundamental in human psyche, right? Which is we want to participate, we want to make, uh, and you know we all have different talents and different things we can and can't do. But uh, but one of the real benefits of uh, of the gamer culture is people can uh, actually be active participants in the things they enjoy, and trying to bring that into into music uh, and other forms of entertainment, I think is, is really important. The participation is why I think gamer culture and nerd culture has such a strong audience and such a strong um, cultural footprint. And an example of that is like, you know, they have these bands that tour and their whole thing is they'll play the theme from Super Mario 2 or, or you know what I mean? Like the culture around it drives people to want to be around other people who similarly have participated in the culture. And so it's kind of like nothing else I've seen. And it's really cool how it's connected people and it's, uh, it continues to, yeah, it continues to be inspirational and that video games are definitely art. I, I would, I would say, would you agree with that? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it was, uh, you know, it's funny because part of when I teach the video game law classes, uh, a big part of these early cases were fighting for the kind of recognition that, hey, we're telling stories here, we're creating things, we're entitled to, to First Amendment protection. Uh, this isn't just a, a device that, uh, a machine that does something. And I, I think on the participation point, you know, video games have an obvious way to do it, but yeah, I think you see this reflected in other culture too, right? So. Even those of us who have no musical talent, right, still want to be involved and participate, right? You want to, you want to, it's why you go to concerts, it's why you wear a t-shirt, it's why you uh, participate in these things. Uh, and similarly, uh, you know, fans go to, to Comic-Con and uh, things of that nature, because even if you're not actually making the content, feeling like you are a part of it becomes an important piece of the, of the puzzle. It's interesting how certain video game franchises have been kind of more protective of their brands and, and others have um, kind of kind of been like, oh, OK, well, the fan remix is cool and everything. And like, I was just wondering what like if you have any like thoughts about how that works, is it is it for a video franchise and we won't be specific to be kind of litigious about their intellectual property? Is that more beneficial or does that detract from like? fan fan love of a brand i know we're speaking in super general terms 
Yeah, I, and you know, I mean, I think everybody's got a kind of different judgment, and maybe it feels different depending on the kind of game you're playing. But I think the franchises that are the most enduring are the ones that find affirmative ways to engage their fans, and and one of the ways to do that is allowing mods, is allowing people to build new levels, right? Because that keeps the the community base going, um, and. If you, you know, I I, I I totally understand, particularly with the kind of older version, I put a game in a box and I sell it to you and you put it in your computer and you play it. The, you know, trying to, intellectual property is good at, at preventing piracy or preventing people from just sort of straight out, uh, you know, knocking off, or ripping off your game. But I think when we use it, to prevent that kind of engagement, to prevent people who want to kind of participate in the community and modifications, then we lose something. Mm. And I think we even lose something if you're if you're using intellectual property to try to stop people from making a game that's too similar to yours. Um, you know, the, the there's all kinds of you know, homages, uh, taking of, of some concepts that work in one game and, and get repurposed into others. And, and I think what the game companies have found is that that doesn't actually mean I lose sales. It's not a zero-sum game, right? It's uh, uh, people play more than one game. They like this dynamic. It gets built into another game. They play that. Uh, it gets refined back into a game from the first maker uh, and so forth. And I think music is is the same way to some extent, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, people definitely uh, take from each other and build from each other um, in a way that you know doesn't mean I'm going to listen to your song and not to somebody else's song, but maybe allows both of those songs to be kind of in conversation in a way that wouldn't otherwise be possible. Yeah, you you put that really well, and I think that's then that goes back to the participatory media, where like if you're so inspired by a side scroller that's so iconic doing something that's referential to that is kind of unavoidable in some ways because there are those classic games that that set the bar and and inspired a generation of gamers and so i'm sure you could and i'm sure you do have like could have a full-time jo job trying to like determine that what's legal what's not kind of like a sample clearance lawyer or more like no more maybe more like a music industry lawyer who's trying to figure out if something is an interpolation if it's too referential it's a i'm sure there's a whole precedent and it can be endless <laughs> absolutely yeah you've got all of that everything from my game is too similar to your game right to um to the kind of things that look like clearance i mean you know fortnite has uh, uh all of these um uh, dance moves and outfits and various other things right that they some of which they license some of which they uh they don't and um there's a whole raft of litigation around that with the blockchain space and web 3.0 i'm sure there's a whole like can of worms that that are being opened now when we talk about this stuff with nfts and selling and remixing and I guess my question for you is like, how has blockchain, how has it affected your line of work? And, and does it make these questions more complicated? Yeah, I think in a couple of different respects. So the question I thought you were going to ask me is, do we need to fear a blockchain planet? <laughs> um, yeah, but, do we? Uh, yeah. the, <laughs> I, you know, I don't think so. Yeah. But it is, um, it's definitely a, a, a challenge and it's a real challenge for institutions that are kind of, built around we know who everyone is um, and uh, and what they're doing at all times uh, and to me part of this um, of the crypto revolution feels like uh, the early days of the internet hmm. right we're 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 in a separate space that the governments haven't really paid a lot of attention to yet and don't really fully understand and there's freedom in basically not being noticed by the by the big boys and the um, uh, and the governments haven't stepped in and said we've got to regulate this and make sure that we're getting our taxes and everyone's uh, uh, everyone's uh, signaling uh, who they actually are yeah um, it, but it's been it's been very interesting to me. Um, I mean, I think sort of crypto itself and, and cryptocurrency is interesting because it it kind of brought home for me that, you know what, there's not actually really any difference between a, a stock uh, and a currency. Both of them are things that 
nominally sort of are backed by some big institution, right? A corporation in the case of stocks and a, and a government in the case of currency. But that institution's not really very likely to step in and, and you know, buy it back or say, no, you can't have this transaction. I mean, they might have some desire to, to have the numbers go up. What crypto did is it basically said, you know what, people are buying on the expectation that other people will want to buy. And there doesn't actually have to be anything hidden behind it mm. to make it valuable. Um, and and what more recently with NFTs, what we've done, I think, is to is to say, well, you know, if there doesn't have to be the sort of backing of a corporation or the backing of a company, uh, anything could be the the source of value that makes this a desirable uh, a transaction. And so people NFT'd all sorts of artworks. They've NFT'd um, uh like moments in, in sporting. Um, I have a, a law professor colleague who's actually made a substantial chunk of money in the last two weeks NFTing law review articles of all things. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's it's fascinating to me sort of what people are willing to, to value and pay for. Um, and, and we've sort of separated the, the value, in a sense, from the, um, uh, from the underlying thing. Have you heard about stories where the NFT information itself, the data, isn't actually stored on the blockchain? And if so, how can something like an atomic NFT solve this problem by being the place where the data is actually stored? Yeah, I do think it happens from time to time. And it's, yeah. um, I, I, you know, I, part of the problem is, I mean, this is, this is sort of a wild west, right? There's, there are all kinds of different folks uh, uh, putting out various different solutions here. And I do think it's likely to settle into something where uh, if, I'm, if I'm willing to pay a bunch of money to have this thing, right, I'm going to want some certainty that the thing is not going to disappear. Right. Um, that said, you know, it's also worth noting that um, we've put more and more of our faith in the fact that sort of digital tokens of all kinds are just going to stick around. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I do all my banking online and uh, and theoretically there's money there and it's the same amount of money that it was last week. But um, uh, but there's a there's an element of faith associated with that. Uh, and and I think even increasingly our access to content, right? As as consumers of music or or videos have gone from uh, I own a physical copy to I downloaded something into my computer and hopefully my computer won't crash to I'm streaming it and I hope that it's still available for streaming on Netflix when I get to season two. Yeah. Um, we a, a lot of the things that we sort of kind of take for granted will be around us are in fact, um, you know, links to some files that somebody else has got uh, under their control. And those files, you know, we hope they're, we hope they're permanent, uh, but, uh, but they may not be. 95% of all data from the internet from 20 years ago is not there anymore based on like local servers that are down or things that like mb3.com, you know, old media sites that don't exist. And so that's going to become an interesting question. Like this, if something's permanent, I, I'm thinking about like in terms of like having a precedent for a case or like precedent for a plagiarism case. If you can't find it, it's kind of hard to, to, to sort through all this, right? No, I think that's right. And so actually I've just, I just published a paper this week uh, called uh, Disappearing Content, which talks about how this is a growing problem as we move to a streaming world, right? Uh, you know, it, it, I mean, 10 years ago, right? If, uh, you know, if, if Netflix decided it didn't want to stream something anymore, well, 10 years ago, Netflix was probably mailing you discs and they had a giant catalog, right? Their right. catalog of available movies and, and shows is a lot smaller now because they've got to actually kick it out through their, uh, through their servers to anyone who wants it. Uh, but as we consume only streaming and we don't download, we don't, we don't buy physical copies, they're often not even available anymore. And so some of these shows, some of these things are just going away. So I think we might worry not just about old websites, but that we, that we might see the same thing happening with, with content. Hmm. Music is a little easier just because the files are smaller. Spotify, you know, I, as far as I know, is not sort of kicking things off of the, uh, off of the network, but you know, who knows if Spotify is going to be around in 10 years. 
Um, YouTube's got a lot of old videos, uh, and at some point they're going to say, hey, you know what, why are we storing and making available things that were posted 15 years ago and only 20 people have ever watched? So I think yeah. you, I think there are ways to archive it. The Internet Archive has done a great job of kind of trying to keep a keep a snapshot of what the things used to be. But uh, but yeah, we are in a world where you can't count on the permanence of these things. And I think part of the things that people are dealing with with NFTs is can I can I uh, guarantee myself or at least sort of increase the chance that I'll have some permanence, right? Not just I have a link to a site uh, on some page I don't really know, but is there something that gives me uh, sort of access or control to the uh, to the underlying data file? This other question of like, how do you archive the internet in a way that people will care about as it's become, become so much sharper and clearer and there's more interesting content? Like art and culture is always about awareness right but if you have some sort of like pixelated video from 2005 do people care about it unless it's it's saved in the best possible highest resolution format which then is a whole storage issue and and so yeah it's it's a, it's an interesting question yeah a storage issue and it's and it requires you may have to up convert stuff right um you know we've I, I mean, there's a sort of version of this that you saw with old media, right? People would kind of write, remaster records. They would sort of try to, you know, uh, preserve uh, actual physical films from the, you know, teens and 20s that were otherwise deteriorating. Mm. And and I think we saw some of this with early computer technology too, right? So you know, I somewhere I suspect in this house I've got a bunch of uh, floppy disks. Uh, that have a bunch of data on them, papers from college, uh, right? But, you know, God knows how I would ever get access to that information <laughs> if I wanted it. Um, right. And so I, I, I do think kind of dealing with the, we, we, on the one hand, we have more information and more access to information than we ever have had before. But we also may have this, this kind of sense that it's not permanent, um, and it's it's only going to stick around if there are enough people interested in keeping it around that it gets moved to the newest servers, it's uploaded to the cloud, it's kept uh, available, and that sort of thing. And that it's searchable. And like for me, I have lyrics for songs I've never finished. And it would be so, like I've had computers crash. I had a hard drive crash with a version of my Robot Kills record where I lost a lot of those songs. And if it, it's just like I wish that, I had an easy solution back then, so. Right, and I mean, to some extent, right, the cloud is helpful in this respect, right? So, right. you know, right, we, individual people lost a lot of stuff, right? Putting it in the cloud, make, you know, gives you a lot more freedom. On the other hand, right, as the, as the Facebook collapse uh, 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 shows, right, uh, you can't always guarantee that even the people who are um, uh, sort of in the business of storing this data are, are always gonna be around. Right, uh, you know, things could get hacked, things could go down, companies could go out of business, um, and yeah, it's a. I think it's a. It's a problem, and I don't know what the solution is, mm -hmm. I, because any solution probably is going to look antiquated in ten years, right? You know, I think in, if we'd asked, if we we talked about this problem of, uh, you know, in in 1999, we'd have said, well, all right, we're going to burn them all to CDs. <laughs> Uh, and we'll just have a kind of big pile of CDs that will sort of store all of this information. Uh, and, you know, 20 years later, that would have been essentially useless to everybody. Uh, Mark, I wanted to ask, ask you something else. So you talked about, and we talked about earlier, um, the value of competition, how it drives people to innovation. And that's what this archiving um, debate is that people have been having that we've touched on, which which I love, and I think it's going to be a, a continued to talk about until the the cor the correct solution is found. But I always think about innovation in terms of like the remix of the idea of like building on different cultures and how the best stories, for instance, Star Wars. You know, that's that's like a Joseph Campbellian remix of, of folk mythology, how all the best art, all the best storytelling is remixes of the past, which brings us to this question of like, okay, intellectual property in NFTs, right? Like, since it is the Wild West, if someone were to do a parody or a or a take on the Simpsons or, or, or some sort of something that's not in the public domain yet, but is in the public consciousness. Has there been any precedent on what is illegal with NFTs with like remix art? 
Yeah. I, so I think on the I I think if it's if it's remixed or parodied, I don't think the NFT issue is going to be any different than the. Uh, than my sort of desire to release that, uh, you know, put up a YouTube video or something of that nature, right? Which is which is not to say we, you know, have a clear answer. We fight about this stuff all the time in copyright law. Yeah. Um, but but we've got some lines where you know we're we're drawing the kind of more transformative uh, the the work that I make, the more it sort of comments on the original, the more courts are willing to to say, yeah, that's acceptable. And I think. Courts are mostly coming to a recognition that, you know, well, we don't want you to just sort of straight out copy what somebody's done. Um, we understand that, you know, you are going to take from them and, and build on to that um, and that that's sometimes OK. Mm. Um, NFTs are interesting because I think a lot of the things that people are making NFTs of um are not in fact uh, remixes or or parodies or that sort of things. I think there's a you know there's a decent amount out there of well I have a you know I, I purchased a, a a physical copy of a work of art and you know now I I'm, I'm going to make an NFT of that um, and there I think probably people's instincts and people's expectations right which is i have a physical thing this nft is a it's mine it's uh it's yeah it's a digital link but um but it's it's really just this one copy may differ from how the law is going to look at it the law is going to look at it and say you know it's the copyright owner who's got the right to do that you know mm. you can't just go make an nft of somebody's work even if you own a copy yeah and that's been a that's been at the heart of this right like you could if your is your picture of Mona Lisa at the Louvre that you took that has sort of like a certain framing, can you sell that? What that's it's a really interesting question. And so there's so there's been no precedent set yet. And do you think there will be though, or is it too hard? I think we will start to see some, right? So my guess is, you know, some of the kind of more commercial high end uh, uh, NFT folks like these sort of sports shot moments. Uh, that that's probably where we're going to start to see some of the first uh, litigation around this, right? Because there is a demand for it. Um, you know, they're 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 drawing pretty substantial uh, prices for these. Um, but it's also, you know, one of the interesting things about NFTs, and you know, to me, this sort of says something about uh, uh, our society and, and how we think about scarcity and economics, right? People will pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to have right, the NFT of this one basketball shot. Um, even though you could watch that same, uh, basketball shot on YouTube for free. Right. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. And so I think part of what you're paying for is not just, you know, I get to watch this cool thing. I get to see this cool thing. You're paying for the exclusivity. Right. People are willing to, to spend a bunch of money for the scarcity. Um, it's a if you think of it as kind of the digital equivalent of the uh, uh, Wu Tang Clan album Once Upon a Time in Shaolin, right? Um, yeah. Right. We're we're only going to make one copy, uh, and people plunk down a lot of money to have the one and only copy. <laughs> yeah, you, that's an interesting point, Mark. Like that was the OG NFT that right. Martin Screlly bought. Yeah, that that's that's true, and it's like. There's this this other thing where it's like I don't know if you remember the, there was this band Negative Land and they did a oh sure and remember they did that U two um, they did a U two and then it became the label recalled it they they were sued but the the freaking CDs that were sent to radio stations with the promo were so valuable because it was illegal um, right and so it's like it's like okay so if you you have a a basketball nft that's illegal that thing is gonna either it's either gonna completely deflate its value or be like oh gosh this is worth a lot because it's you, because it's decentralized you can't really recall it like a label could which is interesting yeah so. i think that's right unless unless right what it's just pointing to a link in a centralized server right and so i think one of the interesting things from copyright and nft perspective is right do i actually own and possess the data attached to this thing right and i and i take it with me somewhere or if what i really got is just a link to uh to your server right if i've just got a link to your server then then what i'd expect to see is copyright owners go into the company and saying hey take that down just make that link not work anymore yeah and then and then it would be have no value but if you had an atomic nft where the data was actually stored exactly. too 
It's really interesting. Um, this is this has been a really cool interview, and like you obviously, all our interests align, and it's a joy to talk to you, Mark. And I'm just wondering, as we wrap up, can you just share? What are some game like games you've been playing recently in your free time? I know you're a very busy person, but any games you've been enjoying? Uh, what am I? What I'm playing? I've been playing uh, Genshin Impact, um, which is the sort of uh, 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 big Chinese uh, Breath of the Wild uh, uh, clone, I guess. Although it's kind of taken on more than that. I do play Fortnite. Um, Games I love. I mean, I tend to I tend to gravitate towards the sort of big open world fantasy stuff. So um, Horizon Zero Dawn, God of War, uh, all of that sort of thing. That's awesome. And you're on Twitter, so if everyone, all the fans listening at home, Mark Lemley, L E M L E Y, on Twitter. And then um, yeah, and and we will keep in touch. But thank you for your time. This has been really cool. And well, thanks. And it's a, as I said, it's a pleasure to pleasure to talk to you. I've been a big fan for for some time now. So, thank you, Mark. I appreciate right. you. Take care. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at R Drive App, or check us out on Facebook, facebook.com slash R Drive Apps. Instagram is R Drive App, and be sure to check out the new site. It's awesome. R Drive In two weeks, we'll be talking to R Drive CEO. Bill Materis about his love of black metal and how he launched our drive and how he got to this point. So be sure to tune into that. Thanks for listening to the first episode. Please give us a review on iTunes or whatever your favorite streaming platform is for podcasts and spread the word. Thanks a lot.